Morning, everyone. Thank you for coming back. Um, before we start with the panel, I have a small service announcement. One, that we have some medium shirts that we found. I believe there were some people in the audience who were looking for a medium shirt and you got a shirt that was an in inappropriate size. Uh, speak to us later, we will sort you out. Um, the next thing is that uh, we have been sponsored two coffee machines we have yet to see um, by Amazon Web Services. And we are going to do a live coding random draw later. So if you're interested in testing your one-line Python solution to reading a file and uh, selecting a random name, speak to one of the organizers later. Uh, then uh, I'd like to announce uh, Simon Cross uh, and the panel, which is Teaching Python. Um, Simon, all yours. Thank you. Morning. Welcome to the second day of PyCon Today 2016. Um, we've, and yes, and to the panel on Teaching Python. So we've all learned Python at some point, or are in the process of, well, process of learning Python. Um, and in some sense, learning Python kind of never ends. So um, we're all constantly kind of learning new quirks, new features, new ins and outs. Um, the language is being extended. Um, and of course, learning Python is just part of a kind of a larger journey in learning kind of coding and programming in, uh, in general. Uh, some of us learned Python a long time ago and have forgotten that we had to learn what x equals 5 means. Um, some of us, those of us who have uh, attempted to teach Python recently, um, answering that what does x equals 5 question is actually not that easy. <laughs> um, yes, and um, we all, I think we all tend to assume that um, those around us learned as we did. Um, or as our immediate peers did when, when we were learning. Um, and that's not a bad kind of starting assumption. It's sort of an assertion of our common humanity, a kind of view that, well, these other humans are exactly like us, um, which in some sense is true. But it's also, it's, it's not true that everyone's experiences are the same. Um, people have learned Python in very different ways. They come from very b different backgrounds. Um, the journey can be quite different depending on what you know when you start out. Um, some of us have uh, taught Python, whether that's professionally or whether as a volunteer for things like software carpentry or Django Girls, um, or whether it's just teaching our colleagues um, when they arrive or kind of mentoring juniors at work. Um, so kind of with all of that in mind, um, yeah, I'd like to introduce our panelists who are um, have backgrounds in teaching Python. So all the way on the right, we have um, Anna Makarudza, um, who has been running Django Girls in Zimbabwe and is also busy organizing the very first PyCon Zimbabwe. Um, Next to her, we have Jessica Upani, who is a school teacher who teaches Python to school kids in Namibia and has also been involved in the organizing committee for PyCon Namibia, um, which is happening again early next year. Um, and then we have Michelle Cotel, uh, who lectures computer science at the University of Cape Town. And lastly, we have Andy Rabagliati, who teaches people Python at the Center for High Performance Computing. Um, so I'm just going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and say a little bit about what they do. So starting with Anna on the right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Makarudze um, from Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm an ICT consultant as well as a freelancer, a Python Django developer. Uh, my experience with teaching Python is uh, through organizing uh, Django Girls. I've organized Django Girls Arare and Mashingo. So far, we have another a second edition of uh, Django Girls Arare together with our PyCon. Uh, the kind of attendees I have had uh, during those workshops varied between, uh, from girls uh, as young as eight and nine uh, up to ladies who are 60 years uh, old. We've also had um, experienced programmers who have done other languages as well as uh, beginners. We've also 
had uh, students from uh, Mashingo Polytechnic as well as uh, Great Zimbabwe uh, University uh, attending the workshops. I've also taught um, a, ba a bunch of teenager, uh, teenage boys uh, programming. Uh, and oh, one thing that I found uh, to be common with my um, attendees was that uh, they were very eager and keen to learn Python, and they found uh, Python to be a very user. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jessica Upani. I'm from Namibia, and I'm an undergraduate student. Uh, I study math and computer science. Um, I'm the chair of Python Namibia, the society, and I'm also a high school teacher. I teach computer studies for learners of the age between 13 and 16. So that's like the junior level of, of high school. Yes, so yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, hi, I know, I know some of you. I'm Michelle Cattell from University of Cape Town, Department of Computer Science. Um, we started teaching Python some years ago, I think about six years ago, as our first language. Uh, the course has increased in size hugely, so this year, I think we had 750 uh, in our first year course, spread, spread over two sessions. Um, and in total, uh, we teach Python to about 1,000 students uh, in first year every year. So uh, it's very popular. Hi, um, my name's Andy Rabaliati. Um, I teach Python at the Center for High Performance Computing um, at um, CHPC here. Most of our students are pre-selected from university graduates, so we expect them to um, at least have had some programming experience, if not Python. Uh, myself, um, I learned Python um, as when I was doing system administration at the um, African Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Musenberg. So um, it's been uh, compared to like just only 10 years or so. Um, and um, I've also had some experience bringing um, uh, computers and Linux specifically to uh, rural schools in South Africa. Oh, thank you. Um, so we have mugs for good questions, which the panelists will award um, if they like your question. Um, and it's completely up to them. Uh, we have uh, runners with mics for at the front and at the back. So if you have a question for the panelists, raise your hand and someone will bring a mic to you and um, you can ask your question. Um, to, to start things off, I want to just ask the panelists what they see as Python's strengths and weaknesses um, in the classroom. <laughs> what makes Python a good or kind of bad language uh, to teach? Um, from my own perspective, um, I think that but I learned um, object-oriented language languages uh, starting with Java, and um, I thought I could learn it out of a book, and um, I failed. And um, I find I had to go to a course to actually um, unthink my uh, uh, procedural-based languages like uh, Fortran and Basic and Pascal and C and all those other ones. Um, to come up with, and what I see Python is doing, is it's um, starting um, at the beginning with um, a proper object-oriented language. And I think that's very important today that um, we start with a good grounding there and that they're, they're using a, um, a, a proper object-oriented language. Uh, what I think uh, the major strength about Python is uh, it's written uh, in simple English. It's, you can actually read the code and understand what you're doing. Uh, there are abbreviations, but they are not so complicated as in other languages which I've learned. So it has actually made uh, learning as well as teaching Python to others uh, easy because it's close to simple uh, plain English, which I speak every day. Yes, um, what I have noticed <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> What I have noticed um, with Python compared to other languages is that it's easy for me to focus on the main concepts of programming, especially when you are teaching young children who cannot relate to these things 
um, they find it difficult to understand algorithm and programming in general. So with Python, everything is simple and it's to the point. So you don't spend a lot of time, you know, explaining Kelly brackets and so forth. You get straight to what the learner needs to learn about. So um, it makes it easy for me to teach the learners for them to understand the concepts as, it, as they are supposed to be. And also um, something else is uh, we, are, we are told to emphasize uh, mainly on testing. When a child writes some code, they need to test it. And with Python, it's so much easier to test as, 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 as you are coding. So I find that also a good advantage to use Python for teaching learners. Um, I'm not sure about the object orientation because actually we don't do that at all. We decided not to in our first course in Python. So we, we don't actually teach object-oriented Python. Um, I have some opinions about that. Um, <laughs> and I'm not actually sure how helpful it is to teach object orientation right off the bat. Um, Python's great in comparison to Java. You don't have to explain all the strange syntax uh, so students can get into programming quicker. I actually personally don't think Python's great for young kids. I actually do do a computer club. Um, I've experimented a bit at my daughter's school. And the lack of sort of graphical pizzazz is uh, difficult. So I've actually found Scratch great for young kids and um, that they can do a lot more quicker that, that they find interesting. And I'm talking about 10 years old, 10 to 12 or 9 to 12. Um, so that, that's my opinion. Jessica, do you want to say anything about your experiences with, uh, well, teaching students uh, kind of graphic, well, graphics with Python? <coughs> the, the, the challenge, okay, Scratch is a good starting base for school learners, but then again, at some point, the learners have to start learning text-based programming. And then the difficult thing is now switching between the two. How do you figure out switching from Scratch to text-based programming? Because you, you come from Scratch where you have uh, the learners create good program programs. Like they would have objects moving up and down. They would have nice games and, and all these graphics and, and music in, in the programs and all this excitement. Then you come to text-based programming. You come to Python and all of that is out. So for them, they, they want to start experiencing that as well. So I think we should, uh, we, should, we should find a way to switch, to find the balance between the two. Something like um, Pygame Zero, I think, is, is good because um, it encourages the learners to create games, but there's not too much uh, complicated coding. So if we can have more of such programs, maybe to improve the graphics of Python, then it would be good for the learners because it is a challenge. It is a challenge. And if you, if you have taught the learner the text-based, they would want to see the application, the, how the GUI is looking like and all that. And now for you to start teaching that, it's a whole other discipline. So it's, it's an extra effort. So, yeah. So my question is about motivation. Um, I mean, irrespective of which language you learn, the idea of programming is actually quite foreign to people who haven't done it before. And there's a kind of, you need to go through almost like a gravity well you have to dig out before it starts getting fun. So do you have any specific uh, advice for how you motivate? What, what do you do to motivate kids that they think this is exciting, I want to do it? Why, why, why would they want to learn programming? Are you asking me? Uh, okay, uh, what I'm realizing uh, with kids today is that uh, they are more we, uh, geeky and uh, tech, uh, techies than we were. Maybe be it's because of the gadgets that they grow up with. So if you buy a phone uh, today, before you figure how, out how to use it, you give it to a three or four year old, they are already playing around with it. <laughs> so. What, what I've been using uh, as a strategy to get kids involved is I've been telling them that instead of just uh, playing games or uh, using applications that have been developed by others, do you know you can actually be developing your own games and uh, applications? 
through learning programming. So that's how I've managed to get uh, teenagers involved in programming. So I tell them that instead of just being a consumer of this product that has been made by somebody else, you can actually uh, start your uh, programming your own app and you have your own app that you can deploy. So uh, the idea of actually making something from scratch, uh, something that they have thought of themselves then uh, gives them the motivation to learn programming. I think um, I, I saw recently um, uh, I was, there, there was a free uh, program in town where you could learn Android programming. And um, I went along because I wanted to be able to program things on my phone. And I looked at how Google approached this. Uh, so Google is trying to get people to write programs. So, and this is from scratch. So they, they say, you know, we'll teach you how to program Android from scratch. And um, one of the things you need is a fairly large computer to run their software development system. But once you're over that, the first thing they looked at, they put a lot of effort into making one screen, you know, like placing objects on the screen just so that you can like make a shape on the screen as opposed to making it do anything. Like first of all, you get the graphics. And then after you've done that, then you can do like press a button and do this and, and stuff like that. And um, Again, I suppose I'm, I'm uh, not trying to teach kids from scratch. I'm teaching adults um, who can program already and must um, use this in science. So I'm in a slightly different perspective. Um, I, they're going to have to know this. So there's an, they don't have a choice, OK? Um, so um, I'm coming from that perspective. But uh, looking at how Google do it, you start with the pretty stuff, and then you move on. I just have a short thing to say. Um, I've thought a lot about what motivates people to program. I think you also need to acknowledge that it's not for everyone. Not everyone wants to do this. But those who do, to me, it's about creativity, actually. It's, it's the same reason some kids really like an art class. You don't have to justify why they like an art class. You just have to facilitate the art class. Uh, and I feel programming actually is about that, and it's about showing them great stuff they can do and facilitating it, but it, it's really a creative exercise and you have to recognize that, that they're wanting to make, you know, programmers are makers and, and you have to show them that they can make with the tools. Hi. Um, so my question is more regarding a South African issue. I don't know what Zim or Namibia are doing with regard to this, but um, a few years back, well, I'm not sure how long ago, countrywide schools are now, the curriculum is to teach Delphi. Um, I personally have my own opinions about this, but I'm interested to know what your opinions are. Um, do you think that this is going to be damaging to the number of students we get in universities studying computer science? And do you think it's possible to change that one day? Like, I would like Python in high schools, personally. Um, well, I think we've excluded Namibian from the question, but... Um, Sorry. And, uh, okay, um, I have issues with Delphi. It's religious war. The a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of our students have actually programmed before, and have done programming at school, and that is a massive issue. I mean, it's even, if you just look at... Uh, the gender bias in, in that, and look at even with top schools in, in Cape Town, then there are zero girls' schools that teach programming. None. And there used to be some. So we don't actually rely on people having done any programming before. And you could maybe, uh, I have heard it argued that any programming is better than none, so Delphi's okay. <laughs> I can't say I really have um, uh, much to comment about that. I do think that um, it's not always necessary to teach the mainstream language. I think it's actually quite useful to teach some um, languages that are outside of the mainstream so that people have a perspective on, on their own. If, you, if, if the world programs in C and you just teach them to program C, then all they do is they just, everything's C. Whereas if you teach them Lisp, okay, and then they later on they have to learn C, they've got a, they've got a lot more perspective on what C is and what Lisp is. Um, going back to the uh, earlier 
something about um, uh, teaching, uh, talking about mobile development and doing stuff on your phone. When I tried to learn Android development, I found it incredibly frustrating to go from the tutorial, hello world, everything's great, to okay, now I have something I want to achieve and the tools don't work for me. Uh, has that been something you've noticed in, in teaching where the, the simple stuff is great and easy and everyone's enthusiastic and as soon as you want to move on to something that takes a lot more work, there's a lot more frustration involved, has that been sort of a demotivating factor? Yeah. Um, as for me, it's, it's again moving from text-based programming to now graphical user interfaces. The learner wants to be excited. Like it's it's different. Like Andy mentioned that when you are at university, you have made that choice to study programming. So whether you like it or not or whatever, you have to study it or you have to to understand what's being taught to you. But at school level, the learners are not. Sometimes they have been put into these computer studies because of their parents, or they have just. Been, it wasn't really their choice to be there. So they, they need to be motivated. You teach them text-based programming, and then all of a sudden they want to see some excitement, they want to see some graphics and so forth. And then that's where the frustrating part comes in, because now they don't really understand how to link events to clicking and, and, and all those things. So just the distinction in Python between text-based and graphics is what breaks the, the mood. Um, I, I think that... Um for no motivation there's there's no substitute for having a having a job to be done you go along and you say well this is what i want to achieve i want to be able to do this and then you sit down with your programming language and you try and get that done um, as opposed to here's a programming language let's play around let's try this let's print that um, well, what is a fibonacci series uh, this, that, there's there's no there's no direction there if you say like i want to program this game or i want to um, uh, write something that'll pick a lotto number or, or like just do something then i think that you're looking at the language from a different perspective and um, uh, that's uh, handy so when when I started programming, it was I'm over here. Um, it was by because I had a ZX Spectrum, and you had to type in games, and then you could try and modify them. And so I found one of the most helpful things with my own kids was to actually start with something that's already a running game, and then make some changes to it because it's like an incremental way of learning. I don't know if any of you have found like tried that approach, or if it's something that could be incorporated more in the way that we teach things. Maybe not. I think. I think. <laughs> I think with again going from my um, uh, Google Android experience, they start with that. They say, "Here's this thing. Um, this is the, the, these are the bits and pieces." They give you most of it. It's all practically there. But there's now uh, you've got to change your color. You've got to change your shape. Um, change the text. Um, something like that. But they they give you a framework, and then they they the they you kind of. They, they take their hands off and then they go and grab the wheel again, you know, which is, it's, it, it works, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I mean, I, I tend to do that for, for more advanced classes. Um, I do think that there's a sort of psychological barrier if you've just managed to fix one thing in this complex thing. It's still that sort of fear of the unknown. I, like, I don't really know what's going on here. And I think there's a lot of value in building up from a little task to bigger tasks. I've seen this more with younger kids, actually. You know, a lot of them like to start off with, I have a whole pattern. They love to have, I teach mostly young girls, and I have theories about that too, but it, there's some differences. But they, they love to start off with like an argument between two characters getting nasty or something. You know, that's like step one. And you know, then they get on to sort of like the magic, what's a cue ball? Uh, you know, where, where you ask a question and it goes, oh, perhaps, or yes, definitely, or no, you know, that kind of thing. So I actually think there's a lot of value in people building up their own little hill of beans of things that I know all of this, and I've built it all. <laughs> and that thing where you've got this big machine and you're tweaking this one thing can actually in some ways be handicapping. I, I, it's just my feeling. I uh, just wanted to remind the panelists that there are mugs that they can award. <laughs> I have a question uh, over here. <laughs> um, 
In answer to the earlier question, it was uh, uh, answered twice that uh, Python syntax is an advantage when teaching newbies. Uh, I'd like to ask what aspects of the syntax could actually hinder learning amongst people who are absolutely new to programming and hence that one has to keep in mind when teaching people who have no programming experience whatsoever? Uh, indentation. <laughs> I think uh, it's one of the most frustrating thing about uh, Python. Uh, the moment you don't uh, make the correct indentation, uh, your program doesn't run. So I think that's one of the uh, syntax issues that I've uh, seen with Python, especially wh wh whether you are learning or you are teaching someone. If you don't make the correct indentation, your code will not run. Then also uh, spellings, if you misspell either a keyword or your variable, uh, yeah, you can get into trouble wondering why uh, am I getting an error. So yeah, mistyping uh, keywords can be also something that you find uh, as a problem. Then uh, missing brackets, that's one, also, that's one thing also about uh, Python syntax that I found to be a challenge. If you don't put uh, a closing bracket, it will actually highlight uh, the line below instead of the actual line which is going to an error. So you are, you, lo you are looking at the line which you have wrote correctly, but you are tell you are, it's telling you that there is an error in that line of code. So it's, it actually makes it uh, debugging a lot more difficult because you'll be looking at the wrong uh, place. Um, I have to say, I'm a curly bracket man myself. <laughs> um, I, I, I've, I've, I've got used to I've, I've got used to the indentation, and, and um, I've, I've, I shrug and I move on now. But um, I'm, I'm a I'm a curly bracket guy. I have a sort of follow on to that. Are there any specific suggestions that the panel have for? making the indentation friendlier, um, better error messages. Um, we do have actually people in the audience who could make those changes. <laughs> um, uh, syntax aware editors, of course, um, uh, absolutely. Um, to, to be able to just go to the top of my VI and just say equals capital G and just have everything fixed is lovely. I actually don't have a problem, a big problem with indentation. I wouldn't want to introduce more coding or more curly brackets and, and all that. Um, I think if we can just explain it properly to the learners, it would be, it, it does work, but they, it's just, they, they, they find it difficult to find the bugs. And again, when, when you run the program, it will tell you that there's an error, but it doesn't really tell you where the error is specifically. So it's, it, it does take time to even teach the learners to understand or to read the errors because the, when they see errors, they are kind of scared. And, and, so, and, and, and the errors are not really specific to say that you have not done this or you have not done that. And if they are still new, they find it difficult to find the bugs in the programs. But I don't think I want to introduce something a lot more. Uh, as simple as it is Python, that's how I like it. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, yeah. Um, so, a slightly vaguer question. Um, what, if any, impact have you seen um, on teaching Python and code in general from the e learning revolution, and uh, especially at a school level? And um, would, do you have any advice on delivering e learning to underprivileged or more rural areas? Uh, we can make it a mug for that one. What do you say? <laughs> Thank you. E-learning to the rural areas. Um, I think uh, it's a tough one. I think that um, like rural areas, they rely very much on their teachers. Um, I, I don't think... Uh, that certainly, internet has uh, has moved on from when I was trying to teach in the rural areas, and now you can get internet on your phone, and people are a lot more aware of these things. Um, but I, th I think still uh, the, the the teacher is critical um, out there, and um, 
you don't have a, a decent teacher, the efforts like uh, one laptop per child and things like that to try and uh, decouple the teacher from the process, I think are just doomed. Um, I think you, uh, it's imp very important to keep the teacher in the loop. Okay, uh, for us, e-learning would be a problem because we, when we were organizing a Django Girls Mashingo, uh, there were internet issues and Mashingo is a town. Actually, it's a city in Zimbabwe. So what we had to do is I had to make an extra trip to just go and deliver hard copy forms so that I could get applications for the event. So for us in Zimbabwe, I think uh, e-learning in the rural areas would be a bit uh, too ambitious because we still have uh, internet coverage issues. Yes, and it also comes down to the resources. With e-learning in rural areas, you need to motivate the teacher to be interested in, you know, uh, in learning on the internet and, you know, just getting excited about learning things on the internet and using it. And then also there are no resources in rural areas. So if you want to go into that, you need to provide all the resources. In, in cities, maybe it's better, but in rural areas, you need, there's so many things that you'll need. You need to plan it properly. Uh, w one more thing. Um, I've, I found that strangely, you'd have thought, oh, well, out in the rural areas, surely, I mean, something they could really use would be internet. Okay? And I, uh, like, so if you try and bring internet to them, it's, they, they, they're not actually interested. If they don't have it, and um, they don't miss it. So um, it, it's not like they're hungry and they're waiting to get a hold of this. It's like, well, what's this? You know, it, it, uh, we say, but this is everything, okay? And it says, well, it doesn't work for us. Uh, I just want to make uh, the labs are crucial for learning Python. And, you know, e learning is fine if you already know programming. And I, I think e learning works great if you're already educated, but that's not the issue. The issue is having some poor kid spending three hours with some bug that you could look at and go, oh, indentation. You know, this, this actually isn't part of your loop, this line. So that's why it's not happening at every step, indented. That'll save three hours of frustration and maybe make them keep up with it rather than say, I hate this subject, I'm leaving. You know, so, so I actually, um, I mean, e-learning is great for supportive stuff, but I, I don't think you can t solve anything. I think you, act, you need people. We have another question up front. Hi. Um, so my question is computational thinking, algorithms and so, um, versus language syntax, indentation. Um, which is more relevant and which do you emphasize on? That is, does, does it really matter um, which language you teach as a first um, programming language? I'm going to say some more. Um, I don't think it does unless the language itself puts barriers in the way. I'm not that keen on Java as a first language because I think it's very hard to understand public, or well, I have to remember public static void main, you know, all that. Why am I doing this, you know? So I'm a big fan of Scratch. It's computational thinking. You can get some weird things where actually trying to explain to students that what they have is actually a multi threading bug because one character is interrupting the other character and they can't time it properly. You get some, but that computational thinking, I think, is the key. Once people can do the mapping, once they know how to think computationally, they can map to any language you can teach them. Okay. I need to okay. get two of those mics, please. Okay. Uh, I'll give him a mic. Thank you. No. For the computational <laughs> thinking question. Uh, we have quite a few questions at the back. Yeah. Um, oh, yes, uh, Peter, um, a mug was warded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, a few years ago, uh, my daughter t uh, took a class from grade nine at UCT, uh, learning Python, and I was absolutely delighted. Uh, it was fairly mathematical, and she, she did well with that. But she, she ended because she was the only girl in the class. Mm -hmm. And uh, she just felt a bit out between all the guys. And I think the context of the learner and the context of the teacher uh, is very important. And uh, in rural areas uh, as well, 
So Django Girls on Gigaty, there's no description for those that are uh, ignorant of that. Could you just uh, clarify how you, how you address that in a gender sensitive way? Uh, okay, uh, Django Girls, uh, it's a global foundation uh, which is aimed at increasing the number of uh, women in uh, the programming and engineering field. Like if we were to do a statistics of uh, men and women right at this conference, you realize that probably we are uh, plus or minus around maybe 10% of the attendees. So the aim is to increase the number of uh, programming, uh, women doing programming. So what we do is uh, we organize uh, free workshops for women uh, in every city and the Django Girls uh, workshop takes the name of the city. If it's being held in Harare, it's, co it's called Django Girls Harare. And if it's happening here in Cape Town, it's uh, Django Girls uh, Cape Town. So it's organized by volunteers who uh, do running around looking for sponsors. And then the women only have to bring their laptops and then they are taught uh, going through a tutorial. Uh, when they need help, a coach can be uh, can be there to assist in uh, teaching in teaching them uh, programming. So it's meant to introduce women to programming and uh, bridge the gap that we have many uh, male programmers compared to women. Um, okay, now I'm I'm not going to talk about the jungle girls, but just the challenge of having few women in in computing. I do understand how your daughter felt because that's also the challenge that we have in Namibia. Right now I have a programming team and on that team there's only one girl. And then sometimes she does ask me like, how do people see you as, as a woman just alone among men? Because now she, she does feel the pressure of like, I have to be um, as good as the men, I have to do this, I have to do that, maybe I'm not good enough and all that. So it's a challenge. So what we do in Namibia is that we started a, a, a women's society that will focus on empowering women. And what we have seen that worked is that when things are done by women, they are less shy. Okay, so if you, if you, if you have a lot, a lot more women who are teaching in your computer science departments, then I, I think it will encourage more women to, to go out and not feel shy. Because we have gotten a lot of women come out of their shells by organizing events for women by women. So I think we should encourage more women or train them more so that they have more confidence to be out there and teach these courses instead of just men. Just a, 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 a small data point. Um, many years ago, I, was, uh, I spent two weeks in Caracas in Venezuela um, teaching programming. And it was a class of about um, 30 to 40 people. And it was about 50-50 um, men and women. And nobody even noticed the gender gap. Uh, I really think you need to get women young. I, I think the sort of conditioning that you don't like, that programming is not for you, starts young. It doesn't, doesn't stop. I still had comments in my class that uh, Michelle doesn't break the mold of women being bad at computing, you know. <laughs> Great, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, I really think it needs to start young before they get these preconceived ideas about what, it, you know, uh, I'm in computing because my dad bought a Commodore 64 when I was a kid. That's why I'm here. And he was very supportive of me programming and still is, <laughs> you know. So uh, I, and I dropped computer science in second year because I couldn't take it anymore. You know, I really couldn't take the sort of culture of I'm use. You know, you're useless, uh, and and I really wasn't. <laughs> so you know, it took me a long time to realize that I dropped computer science because of the culture, not because of the subject. Uh, and then I eventually came back. But um, I, I do think it's a really big issue. I also don't want to beat the drum too much. I think also some of it's to do with how we teach programming. I do think there are male and female differences. They, it's a it's a spectrum, a distribution. But women tend to prefer, and, I, and I'm not actually including myself in this, but tend to prefer more applied computing. You know, we, we like the complications of, of humanity, uh, and I have some theories about this, and I, and I do think that if you're teaching boys, you kind of want to abstract out the problem from, say, the context. 
And if you do that, you actually put girls off often. They find it very dry and boring. So you actually want the context. You want two characters fighting with each other, not solve this sort of uh, timing problem. I have a lot of theories about this, but I, I do think culture matters. I dropped computer science and came back because of culture. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I was the only, we were only three in my stream doing uh, computing. I was the only girl. Then uh, my physics class, we were 20 and there were two girls. So how our physics teacher helped us was, uh, uh, he said that we are all boys here, yeah, we are all girls here. Yeah. So that uh, made it easy for me to blend uh, uh, in the class because we didn't mind uh, the gender thing. Uh, so it made it easy for me to continue within the field because uh, even when I proceeded to uh, university, even in the work environment, you find that it will always be uh, plus or minus 10% uh, women and the rest are men. So I think you, you need to help your child or we need to help girls realize that this, uh, this has nothing to do with uh, gender. You still can do it. Uh, programming is for everyone, whether you are male or female. Back. Hi. Uh, so considering the extent to which software is eating the world, uh, have we reached the point yet where it should be mandatory for all children to learn some measure of programming literacy? Yes. <laughs> I think it's uh, difficult to say. Um, I think we come from a, a, a blinkered viewpoint and we love programming and so we think everybody else should do the same. Um, I don't think I'm actually able to answer that question. At the back. Um, okay, just a quick thing on the male versus female industry which it uh, keeps getting called out. I think uh, it's been changing. If you look at varsities now, it's changed a lot. My honors here, we were almost half-half uh, in my class. Um, I'm dating a girl who's a dev as well. I think the biggest thing in the industry, though, is if you look at the perception, it's the girls are usually the project managers and the business analysts because they don't get as technical as the guys. I think that's where it's breaking. Like grassroots, it's it's as access to education is improving, more girls are getting into programming. The, the actual thing I wanted to say was, um, I mean, when I started, my first programming was a logo. So very sort of interactive, quickly got me interested when I was at school. Um, but then when I sort of lost the, the, the track a bit was when I got into doing stuff like C Sharp and Java, where you didn't really get the point or the interest sort of faded. So. Um, if you look at how cheap embedded systems have got lately, you can buy little chips for $2 um, and you can take it to the rural areas and actually show people that a little bit of code can set off lights, can connect to the internet. Um, is it not the best way to start just getting people interested? If along the way they don't get as interested in the computational stuff, that's fine. Um, you still need web developers versus people figuring out why your threading's breaking. So, like, get people involved in, like, blinking lights and graphics changes, and then later get them more to the computer science side of things. Hmm. I'm not sure if there was a question in there. Do anyone? Yeah, I... I, 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 I So, I, thank you for your comment. I think that's <laughs> great. Yeah. Um. Am I on? Yeah. Uh, so, I'm one of these people who, as an adult, has uh, persevered through Code Academy and has tried to talk myself to code online, and it's really hard, as you've pointed out. Um, for me, what I've learned is that there's a big barrier between being able to do it in the sort of online, nice, safe world, and then moving to building something from scratch that's your own thing. So I wondered if you guys had any advice of what is a great first project that is not sort of in a controlled space that you can figure out as a relative newbie and does something and you can build a program and it does something awesome and it's yours. 
I, I, I built radios with transistors when I was a kid, okay? That was great, okay? Everything was completely under my control. Um, in, a, in a programming environment, um, um, I, I, I can't... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I think the great first project is something you care about. So I have thought about this quite a lot, and I have realized with, pro with classes I run, most successful projects are when people come up with their own project and they want to solve something, because then you're prepared to beat your head up against it because you really want it. So if, you know, if it's something, f you manage your finances and suck in all your bank account statements and give you a breakdown or something, but you need to care about it. That, that's it. You need to feel the pain, they say in design. And if you can feel the pain, you're willing to go through the pain to solve it. Sorry, I just want to ask, um, before we get someone actually, well, in the class, how do we get them to the class? Uh, as in, it's, it's great knowing how to teach someone, but how do we get them to the class? What do you mean? Uh, sorry, so my, my kids, basically, they obviously know that I'm a programmer, but they don't necessarily understand what I'm doing. And generally don't, I mean, the stuff that I do is quite technical. How do I get them actually involved and have them look at what I'm doing and obviously then slowly get them into programming? How do you get someone asking questions about programming? How do you kind of get them into the programming uh, fraternity? So I think this question is about, again, about motivation and marketing. Play. You, you, you need to play. So, so the, you know, I also have kids, and they don't necessarily like what you like. So uh, there's that. Um, but um, we all, I mean, we spend our time on things we like to play with. So, th so that's what you really need. Yeah. When I was um, teaching nine-year-olds how to use um, uh, Linux um, uh, games, I, I didn't really care what they did, okay? But if they could figure out the menus and the mouse and the this, that, and the other, and they they they, they learned that it, that the passwords beyond the seventh character didn't seem to matter, um, and uh, like they, they found out stuff all by themselves, and uh, mostly just let them rip. I think also it, it would be good to for them to see an example. Like how I got my learners to be interested in, in programming is that I, I just threw the idea just out there and then I show them stuff. And then I got some that were interested. Okay, so I just focused on that those ones that, that were interested. Then I trained them and I got them to do stuff. Okay. So when the others are seeing what these guys have done, the same guys that they're in the same class with, then they start getting interested and say, oh, so I can do this and that with this. Or what is this? Then they get start also coming along and, and trying to learn. So. I think we have time for about two, maybe three more questions. And Pai at the back has the mic. So. Um, <coughs> I want to ask if you're familiar with the, uh, the work of Brett Victor. Um, for those who aren't, um, he has a large body of work on worrydream.com about, um, this goes back to the discussions earlier about textual versus visual programming and so on. And he has a lot of ideas about how we're actually um, approaching programming fundamentally wrong and how we could actually improve that and make it more interactive and tactile and immediate, um, both in our practice and in how we teach and learn programming. And uh, he has many like ideas and thoughts about this, and I'm, wor uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on his work, uh, or perhaps how people here can start applying those ideas, or even pioneering um, new ways of teaching based on those ideas. Uh, his name is Brett Victor. Um. I'm afraid I, Pai, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with the, the subject, so I can't really say anything. Yeah, I think a lot of his work is about faster feedback. So it's about having kind of say, and I think things like Scratch and protocol, uh, protocols, is that the JavaScript library? I'm sure, um, prototype, no, um, are kind of heading in this direction where you get, you edit the code and you immediately see change in say user interface. Um, 
And is, I guess maybe is that sort of faster feedback already important to learners and how important is it? I think, uh, for instance, moving from um, a compiled language to an interactive language um, definitely improves matters um, when you didn't have to type make um, in between each time. Um, so uh, faster feedback uh, definitely helps. Um, and it's, it's nice, uh, again, in the, my Android programming environment, you can fiddle with the XML over here and you can see the picture change on the right. Um, it's, it's, it's quite, um, it's good. Uh, hello. Thank you uh, for the panel. Uh, my question is linked to the question that was uh, presented earlier, and in particular to list uh, developed countries or where resources are and where not as much resources. Um, so I think Jessica actually talk, talked about Raspberry Pis, and you said how those helped. I wanted to find out is this a viable model, pretty much focusing on things like Raspberry Pis and focus and creating libraries that actually run on there to actually facilitate um, uh, teaching Python or teaching other programming languages to under-resourced places rather than trying to get full-on computers uh, there in, in those uh, remote places. Should it, it's not a better model for the community at large just to start focusing on uh, building more robust microcomputers like Raspberry Pis and building libraries that support that. So I guess the question about how important is it to get hardware into the hands of students? Um, that's a good question or comment or I don't know if it was both. But um, yeah, I, I, I prefer Raspberry Pis. They are good to take um, to like rural areas. They are cheaper and, and more convenient. But then it also it, it will be a problem if you want to run bigger softwares. If you want to run basic stuff, if you just want to work on Python, for example, and so forth, then it's good. But if you want to teach learners more programming languages or want to run heavier uh, softwares and stuff, then a Raspberry Pi would be a problem. But to get the basics of programming to school learners, I think a Raspberry Pi would be perfect. It would be perfect. Um, uh, people think that Raspberry Pis are small computers. Um, I, 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 I learned programming on a 50-step um, HP 25. Um, it's not like uh, because it's physically small that, or, or, or even it's, you know, it's only got 128 meg of RAM. I mean, uh, I don't think any of these things are real. I don't think there's any like um, barrier there at all. Um, we all have kind of unfortunately run out of time, but I wanted to ask the panelists if any of them had any closing remarks, any things that they've been wanting to say. Um, and of course the panelists will still be around for the rest of the day, so you're welcome to find them and ask them questions during tea and lunch. Yeah. As for me, I would like for people to create more uh, libraries like Pygame Zero. Um, things that will make it easier for the learners to just start programming and start creating good stuff without getting, b b without being scared of the complicated things of programming. Because you still, they are still at a stage where you just want them to get excited, not um, lose interest because they don't understand things. So, yeah, if we can get more of that and also figure out how we can now move from scratch where everything is nice and, and fun to now text based programming and still keep them interested and not just lose interest after they realize that things are tough here and, and we just don't understand and we don't want this anymore. So if we can get to work into that, then I think it will benefit teaching programming to young learners or to young people. Uh, I think it would uh, help a lot uh, if uh, programmers or professionals uh, like most of us here would uh, actually uh, follow the uh, or uh, make the initiative to introduce uh, other people, especially kids, to programming. Because most, uh, most of the time the teachers aren't so keen on teaching programming because they are not using it. So it's just one of those things they teach like uh, maths or uh, English or uh, history. So it would actually be motivational if uh, programmers would uh, speak to children about programming would actually get more people involved in programming because you are speaking from mm -hmm. experience 
you love programming you enjoy it uh probably that's why you are here i don't think we, we just came because you know we are coming uh what i realized in my class um my undergrad class most people didn't like programming because they just ended up uh, doing computer science or information systems but the very few that uh do love uh, programming have done uh have done many things uh in the field of programming so it would help if professionals like you would actually encourage young people to get into programming because you'll be speaking from experience and it's something that you love and something that you know it can be done and uh, it's rewarding so it's up to us to increase the number of uh, programmers in the next generation by actually encouraging or mentoring young people thank you yeah i want to totally agree with that um in fact i'd like to challenge the audience to to really think about ways that we can get more people teaching programming in schools at primary level uh, because the, the, the difficulty isn't the tools. It doesn't matter if it's Python or, you know, I just like Scratch, it's all online and it's cute. But, um, but the problem is with me, you know, here I'm teaching a club and I haven't done it because I've been overworked. And we need people. We, we need ways of, of funding students so that they spend some time maybe in a school running a little computer club. That's all we need. We need the teachers. Uh, the, 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 it's not the tools. It's the teachers that we need. Um, I would also agree it's about the teachers and something that I've observed that I um, not specifically in my teaching Python but um, particularly um, uh, bringing computers to rural areas and to places outside of the hallowed halls of universities and things like that is that um, the teacher is often scared because you can be teaching a 12-year-old or a, an 11-year-old how to use this computer or this programming language, and suddenly this child knows more than the teacher. Now, that's actually um, threatening. It's threatening for a teacher. And I think we must, um, they're much more used to, uh, if the child doesn't know, just beat them. And um, if you suddenly, the child knows more, now they're being insubordinate, okay, and you beat them. So um, I, I, maybe I'm being somewhat b bland with this, but it's it's. I think it's a problem, and I think um, the teachers need help there. Um, they they must realise that it's okay that the child knows more than them, and I don't know how to get that through um, in a in a rural school based environment where they're they're seen as an authority figure and they don't like being um, threatened. So. Um I just want to say thank you once again to all of the panelists. Um, and so just to reiterate, um, go out there, write more libraries like Pygame Zero, go and teach people Python. Uh, and thank you very much.